I just love getting ready to begin a new sewing project. One thing I learned very quickly is how important it is to have a good needle in your machine if you want to avoid problems with your stitching. Today we're going to talk about how good stitches on your sewing machine are made by good needles. We also have an amazing quick and easy embroidery project done in a hoop that I know you will just love. We have hand embroidery stitches and our dolls will have oh so beautiful slips when we are finished with today's technique. With time flying by, we had better get started. Thank you for joining me today. I am so happy to have as my guest today, my very dear friend, Steve Butler. Steve is representing the Schmetz Needles Company. Steve, welcome to the show. Well, Martha, thank you very much. <laughs> I always enjoy the opportunity to, to be able to talk to people about needles because needles are such an important aspect of what we do in our, all of our sewing Absolutely. projects. Absolutely. And everything. And what I've learned is working over the years with sewing machines, with needles, and with threads, is that the needle is really the most crucial element of all three of them, and I can tell you why. Very interesting. We can actually take any machine, a tired machine that really needs to be adjusted, and we can put on that a very low quality, inexpensive thread, but if we put a nice sharp needle in that machine, where well, chances are we're gonna be able to sew all right. Unfortunately, the converse isn't true. We could take a beautiful brand new machine just adjusted right off the technician's bench, uh, set it down and thread it up with a high quality thread, but if we have an old or a bent needle in that, then chances are we're gonna have some problems. Okay. The thing that we need to remember is we should always sew with a clean, well-adjusted machine. We should always use quality thread products, and we should also make sure we always have a quality needle that's in good condition. The bottom line is if we're sewing with a bad needle, we're gonna have bad results. And unfortunately, also, many times people think that these results are a result of the machine or the thread and not necessarily the needle, which is so easy for us to change. If you'd like, I can cover some of the problems that we oh, have. Oh, I would love to, okay. Steve. I'd love to hear it because I know how critical a needle is. Well, one of the first things that we see when people are sewing and having problems with sewing is they get the frayed threads or the broken threads. As you know, when we're sewing, the thread actually ratchets through the eye of the needle. If the eye of the needle is too small or if it's deformed through use or for some kind of damage, it actually puts more pressure on that thread, more friction, and frays it and will actually break it. Another problem we have is sometimes our needles become bent, and that's through use, or it can be because of some type of damage like hitting a pin or a zipper or something like that that we're sewing on. When that occurs, when this is bent, when we start to sew, as the needle enters the fabric, it actually deflects. And if it deflects away from our sewing hook, then we start getting skip stitches, which a lot of people think they have a timing problem, but it's really just a needle problem. Another problem we can have if the point is bent is that we get uneven stitches and we get crooked seams. And those are things that bother us a lot. Probably the last one I wanna talk about is if we're using the wrong point on our needle or the point is dull because of, of, of use, then what happens is as the needle actually enters the fabric, instead of piercing the fabric cleanly, it pulls the fabric and gives our stitch a very puckered appearance. As it continues on through, it actually tears the fabric and leaves lots of little fibers in the bottom of our machine, destroying our fabric for us. So the bottom line is if you're using a bad needle, you have bad results. It all can be repaired by making sure that we have a good clean needle in our machine. Okay, question. Okay. Um, how often should needles be changed? Whatever needles we're working with, how often should they be changed? Well, it's interesting. It all depends on what you're sewing on. If you're sewing on heavy denim fabrics, canvas fabrics, the needles wear a lot quicker or even quilting. If we're just doing piecing on a quilt or heirloom sewing, the needles can last a little bit longer. Unfortunately for us, we cannot look at a needle and determine if it's perfectly straight. We can put our finger underneath and touch the needle, and it might even prick our skin, but we can't tell if it's sharp enough to pierce the fabric like it should. So what we need to do is just make it a matter of habit to change the needles at routine intervals, probably four to six hours of sewing time. When you figure if you sew for six hours at an average of 500 stitches a minute, you're close to 200,000 stitches. Oh my goodness, with one little needle. <laughs> that's a lot of work for that little needle to do. And so that's one of the good things that we need to look for in, in, in the needle is make sure we just change it. Needles cost probably a dollar each, something like that. So it's the very best, easiest way to make sure 
that we have a good needle. Another thing you want to do to make sure you have a good needle is just use a quality needle. You can spend just absolutely. A few, you can just spend a few minutes online and find any number of companies around the world that stamp out needles by the millions at very ridiculous prices. But these needles aren't always the same length. The eyes aren't always the same size. So what I would recommend is that you find a good quality needle and stay with that needle throughout your, what you're going to use. One of the last things that we need to make sure we do is use a needle that has the right size and the right point on it. The size on a needle is basically a measurement of the shaft. We take the shaft, we measure that in millimeters and multiply it times 100. The reason we do that is, for example, a size 80 needle is really 0.8 millimeters wide. We don't want to go into a store and ask for 0 0.8. It's yeah. just easier to say, give me an 80. So they multiply it 80, sure. times 100. Now, researchers have told us that the eye of the needle should be 40% larger than the diameter of the thread. Oh, okay. Now, the reason for that is, remember I mentioned previously that yeah, the, sure. the thread ratchets back and forth through there. If the eye is that much larger than the thread, it reduces the friction on that thread and allows it to sew much better, and you don't end up with frayed threads, you end up with nice, smooth stitches. Well, none of us at home have micrometers. We're not going to be measuring the eyes <laughs> of the thread or the needle, and we're not going to be measuring the thread. But what we do know is that a size 80 needle works perfectly with a 40 weight thread. So if we're going to use heavier threads than a 40 weight thread, we just need to use a larger needle. If we're going to use light thread weights that are lighter than a 40 weight thread, like your heirloom sewing. Like the 60 and 80 the weight 60 threads. The 60 and 80 weight threads. Then we can go down to a 75 and 80, or a 75, a 70, or even a size 65 needle, just to make sure that's so. But it's absolutely essential that we have an eye that is large enough for that thread that actually protects the thread force as we sew. That is fascinating. And Steve, I know that used to, we used to think, I mean, a long time ago when I was in high school and as a young bride, if when it, you got a new needle when the needle broke. Well, that's a joke. <laughs> that's right. Well, a lot of people. I know better than that now. A, a lot of folks still do that. And I, I can't tell you how many sewing machines I've repaired and how many surgeries I've repaired simply by replacing the needles. Because people yes. come in and they're having skip stitches and they're frayed threads and they think it's a timing problem. But all I do is take the old needle out, put a new needle in, and it sews perfectly. Well, that would be one of the first things to try then. If there's something wrong with the machine, would you say? Repair, replacing a needle or making sure that you have good quality needles is the absolutely the surest, fastest, easiest way to improve the quality of every stitch and the satisfaction from every sewing experience. So if you are spending the time and effort and money to work on any type of project, whether it be quilting, heirloom sewing, or home deck, making sure you have a perfect needle is the perfect way to start that project. And that is certainly an inexpensive way to have these fabulous sewing machines that we have today, not to try to cut corners with using a needle longer or thinking, oh, well, it couldn't be the needle, because it could be. And more, more times than not, it's a problem with the needle. If, if you've been using that needle for some time, or if you've hit a pin, or you've hit some other object when you're putting the needle in, it actually damages the needle. So what I recommend is, if you have any question at all, throw the needle away, put a new needle in, and you start with that, you can have a beautiful sewing project when you're finished. Well, that is completely fascinating. And another thing I know, that I don't think there's a sewing machine manufacturer in the world that suggests sewing over pins. No. <laughs> But, it's such a temptation, but, but we it happens. Never... Oh, well, but and I think happens. then we change needles when we sew over pins. That's right. Steve, thank you so much for being here today. It's certainly been my pleasure to have you share this critical information about needles. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, you so much. You're welcome. And now I have a so quick, so easy project for you. I am so pleased to have as my guest today, Charlotte Gallagher. Charlotte is director of the Machine Embroidery Division of Martha Pulling Company. Charlotte, welcome to the show. Thanks, Martha. You know what? I just can't wait for our viewers to see these machine embroidered baby bonnets. This one being done on netting, and this one being done on a wonderful handkerchief linen. We have two versions, the pink flowers, and then the, the one that would be perfect for christenings with the cross and the three rings. Uh, let me just turn these around so our viewers can see. And Charlotte, the exciting thing is every bit of this, well, all of the embroidery was done in the hoop. Mm -hmm. You see the little circles in the back and the cutest little booties also done in the hoop that go with the shoes. Absolutely precious. Now, Charlotte, I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to let you show our viewers how it's done. Thanks, Martha. The first thing you want to do to make your bonnet is you're going to do the embroidery. And you will 
hoop a piece of water soluble stabilizer, create the, add the parts of the brim, embroider it, then you will embroider the crown piece and that will complete the embroidery for your bonnet. Once you rinse out the stabilizer, you will trim all around it and this is your crown piece and this will be your brim for attaching to your bonnet. You have a pattern. You cut a bonnet from the bo from the pattern and a lining from the pattern, and then you use your crown piece that you embroidered to cut out the pieces for your lining. You sew the back seam, which is the little short seam of the pattern. Then you run a gathering stitch around the crown area pin the crown, having marked both the centers and align them with the bonnet, pin it in and stitch it in a quarter inch seam. Once you have done that for both the bonnet and the lining, you want to put the two pieces together, right sides together, and stitch in a quarter inch seam the back edge. After that's completed, you're going to turn them right side out and you've got your bonnet completed, ready to attach your brim. The brim is attached along the front edge. It's just straight stitch, zigzagged or surged together. The right side of the brim to the wrong side of the bonnet turn it to the right side. Once you've done that, you want to use about a half a yard of ribbon, fold the edge under half an inch of one end, a half an inch again. You want to pin it, and I stitch these by hand across both sides. And then if you want to get really fancy, you can uh, tie a little bow and add to the edge of the bonnet. To create the sh little booties, they are all done in the hook except for attaching the soles to the top. And again, you're going to hook water soluble stabilizer, lay your fabric on it, and the entire booty and sole will be stitched out in the hook. Once you've rinsed away the embroidery uh, stabilizer, you're going to take the top of the shoe. Let me turn this around so you can see it. And then you're going to butt the back edges together and zigzag them to hold them. Then you're going to mark the centers of the sole on the front and the side and you're going to align this piece onto the sole of the shoe. And I have one here that's already done pinned and you're going to stitch in the ditch around to attach the little shoe to the sole. Then to keep it on the baby's foot, I've got a piece of ribbon. I'm going to fold it under a half an inch, a half an inch again, and by hand I'm going to tack it in the center so it looks like a little bow and then we're going to attach it. You can attach it either to the outside of the shoe or the inside and then tie it in a little bow. And that's all it takes to make the complete outfit. Charlotte, these are absolutely adorable. And I know one of the ladies that uh, corresponded with me recently, she had done these booties. And on the bottom of the sole, she had done the baby's name and the birth date. Right. On the other side, she put made by grandmother and put her name. That's so really sweet. Really a sweet way you can really personalize having embroidery on the bottom of the shoes. Charlotte, thank you so much for sharing with us how easy it is to do these machine embroidered booties and bonnets. What a special gift. Thanks. And now I have some hand embroidery to share with you.
I'm so happy to have as my guest today, Sandy Jenkins from Fredericksburg, Texas. Sandy has been teaching sewing, teaching needlework, designing needlework for over 28 years. Sandy has also studied at the Royal School of Needlework in London. Sandy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me, Martha. I love teaching and I love being here. Today I'm going to teach a few stitches that are common stitches that people have a little bit of trouble with or they don't really enjoy as much because it's not easy for them. I'm going to show you a model before we begin of a French knot. I have a different way to do a French knot. As you can see the whole cottage and all the path, everything in here except for the writing is done in French knots. So I have a really wonderful way to do them that's a no fail way and it's really easy. We're going to come up from the top. Now today I'm using more thread, more um, a bigger needle than I ever use. I'm going to come up with a knot. I'm going to wrap my thumb one time over. Okay, lay my thumb down, lay my loop forward, stab the dot really close, pull the thread up tight against the needle, and pull the needle slowly through. I'm going to show it one more time, Martha. It's so perfect every time and you never have trouble. One time over, I'm going to wrap my thumb, lay my thumb where my stitch is, stab close, hold my needle and pull that thread tight against it, and it's a perfect French knot every single time. Another stitch that people have a lot of trouble with is a buttonhole stitch. And I have a lot, several models here to show you, but I'm going to show you the stitch first. You come up with the heavy, where you want your heavy knotted edge to be. The heavy knotted edge, Martha, is that harder or the, the outside edge usually. And you're going to come up and you're going to come down away from it and back up in the loop. And if this were going to be a petal, I have a little surprise here that's creeped up into the front. Let me just get rid of that. We'll start in a new area. Um, you're going to come up with a knot at the outside edge where your heavy knotted edge is to be. You're going to throw your loop in the direction you're going, going down towards the center if you were doing a petal of a flower, and back up in the outside edge. Okay. Many times if you have a larger area on the outside than you do in the center, like if this were a daisy petal, you would need to do long and short stitches inside because it's like a piece of pie. It's bigger on the outside than it is in the center. So that's the reason for the long and short stitches. This creates a heavy or a, what we call a knotted edge on the outside. Now I'm going to come in just a bit so that curve, petal curves a tiny touch and I'm going to go down. This is a buttonhole stitch. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you an example. People have a lot of trouble shading. This is an example of a buttonhole stitch, and this is shading. All it is is long and short stitches split into that. Here's another part. This is split with three colors. So shading is very, very easy if you do it this way. Buttonhole stitch is laid on top for more dimension. Now, that raised edging, I want to show you how to make that. This creates just a little bit more dimension and makes it be a little bit more fun. Today I'm using a color that's a little bit lighter than the color I stitched my flower petal in. I'm going to do a buttonhole stitch coming up at the outside, wrapping the edge or the knotted edge only of this stitch we just laid at the buttonhole. I'm going to continue wrapping that. Now notice the tension again in my little finger. Tension is everything in stitching. And I would normally hold that back with my left hand. So I'd pull it up, come around, and just do as many stitches as is comfortable. And do you see what a wonderful edge that creates and a little bit more dimension? Also, by using the lighter color, it gives it a little bit of highlight on that edge, which is really great. All right, I'm going to come down, and I want to show you an example of that worked in a great way with two colors. I've done the buttonhole and I've slipped in with long and short stitches the dark shading. I've then done a raised edging on the bottom for a little more dimension. I think you'll really enjoy this, Martha, and it can really put a new light on it without making it any harder. Oh, Sandy, thank you so much, and I do love that stitch. Thank you. And now I have a beautiful doll dress to share with you. I am happy to tell you that my Martha doll has the most exquisite Sunday go to meet and slip on. 
we absolutely want to put beautiful lingerie on our dolls and the featured uh, technique is this shell stitch around the neckline today and this shell stitch this beautiful shell stitch around the armholes now i couldn't let this show go by though without showing you this beautiful beautiful scalloped french lace hem that is so pretty and follows the little scallops it is absolutely a beautiful slip now what i'm going to share with you is those that sh it's called actually a shell tuck or a blanket stitch or a blind hem the first thing you do now this is a neckline piece and a, a straight piece let me show you how to do the curved piece you're going to take the neckline of your slip fold it down once and fold it down again and you can do this either on a curve or on a straight piece and then you're going to take your iron of course and press it and press it and press it where it lays down nice and flat whether it's a, a double fold over on a straight piece or on a curved piece as we have on this neckline. Then using your blind hem stitch, you know sometimes it's called a shell tuck stitch, but it's actually a blind hem. It can also be a blanket stitch that you can use, but this shows in a blue stitch so you can really see it, what it really looks like. Now the secret of this stitch when you're making it is to come all the way, the zig and the zag comes, the zig comes all the way off the fabric and then goes back and stitches and then it comes all the way off that means it's going to pull those little shells in and this is such an adorable stitch this is what it looks like in blue and here is what it looks like finished where you use uh, of course thread that's the color now i'm going to stitch a little bit of this for you so you can see this blind hem blanket stitch shell tuck stitch i'm working on the outside of the fabric let me get my foot pedal here wait just a second oh me okay and I'm gonna go all the way off the fabric. I have to go all the way off on that outside zig. And that way the shell is so pretty, but I've gotta be sure I go all the way off. And then it just pulls it right in with that blind hem stitch. Hang on just a minute. On this particular machine, it's called the shell tuck stitch. So your machine, but anyway, if you just have a blind hem stitch, this will work every time. That pretty, pretty, pretty shell tuck. This is beautiful not only for doll slips, but it's also beautiful on, on little baby slips and little uh, edges of little baby clothes. I would like to tell you that it's just as pretty to use on a hem as it is around the neckline and around the sleeves. And this makes a really fast hem. And I know when we do uh, baby day gowns, a lot of times we want to do a slip to go under the day gown. And sometimes you just really want to finish the edges and not go to the trouble or the expense of putting lace. This is the perfect way to get that wonderful little heirloom delicate look. And now I have a beautiful piece of antique clothing to share with you from my vintage collection. This particular dress is about era of about 1900, as so many of my Victorian pieces are. Now, when I bought this dress, it was not in the world's best condition. It still isn't in the world's best condition, but you know, I buy things um, to share ideas with you and for you to see how these wonderful techniques, which have been around way over a hundred years are so applicable for today. Look at the magnificent embroidery and you can also see there's a tear that has been repaired right in the front of the dress. This dress has Clooney lace. Again, lace not in very good condition, but you can still see the beauty of it. The Clooney lace has been mitered down the front. There are release tucks here. More of the Clooney lace has been used and I, the sleeve is so pretty on this dress. I'm going to pull it around here and show you there's a lace shaped diamond with lots of embroidery and three tucks on the cuff of the sleeve and something very interesting about the construction. These tucks are totally stitched by hand. Whereas when we go down to the skirt, which is what we're going to do now, these tucks on the skirt are stitched with a straight stitch on the sewing machine. I cannot for the life of me figure it out why they would use a sewing machine some places on tucks on a dress and a uh, uh, hand on the other. The skirt is beautiful and more release tucks, again, done by machine. Such pretty release tucks. And I do love lace shaped diamonds. Those of you that have been sewing with me for a long time know how I love lace shaping. And these diamonds are so pretty with the embroidery inside of the diamonds. And a wonderful thing is if you have handkerchiefs, you could put your handkerchief inside and have instant embroidery if you're going to use those diamonds. Thank you for joining me today. Won't you come back next time? Thank you.